We are counting down the top 10 matches in SummerSlam history this week. It's number 8 in the countdown. A lot of people regard the 2002 SummerSlam as one of the best, if not the best, of all the SummerSlams. This match is one of the reasons, if not the main reason, why. Shawn Michaels, back in a WWE ring for the first time in four and a half years against his best friend turned bitter enemy, Triple H, in an unsanctioned street fight. Now let's go back in time, give some history and some backstory to this. Of course, the two of them came together to form Degeneration X in 1997. That led to Sean's back injury. He suffered in the casket match against The Undertaker. He went in hurt to WrestleMania 14. He dropped the championship to Stone Cold Steve Austin, and he went quietly into what basically was an unannounced retirement. Triple H, the very next night on Raw, took over to lead his own version of DX and, and try to break away from Shawn's shadow. He had already been in, always been in the shadow of Shawn Michaels. He was always playing second fiddle. This was his opportunity now to break out on his own. For him, in his career, it was probably the best thing that could happen. Now notice I said that this was Sean's first time back in a WWE ring in four and a half years. It was not his first time back in a wrestling ring. He actually made his in-ring return two years earlier in a match against Paul Diamond, who at the time was going by the name Venom, in Sean's TWA promotion, his short-lived TWA promotion down there in San Antonio. This was in April of 2000. Uh, that was a street fight too, just like this one. Uh, the same Paul Diamond that he tagged with at the start of his career and he briefly feuded with, and they even wrestled each other for the Intercontinental title on the very first episode of Monday Night Raw. Diamond was, at the time, he was portraying the Max Moon character that was originally conceived of for Conan. But you watch that match against Venom, which you can find online, and you realize that Sean could have easily come back years before he did. His back was fine, and it really had more to do with his substance abuse problems. In fact, the plan had been for him to come back shortly after WrestleMania 17 for a match against Triple H. Likely it would have been at that Backlash pay-per-view the month, uh, I think it was later that same month. But I, I believe the plan was for him, or at least it was talked about at the time, it was reported on at the time, that the plan had been for him to either interfere in some way, in the Undertaker Triple H match at WrestleMania, or and cost Triple H the match, which would then lead to his return, you know, for the next show, or maybe that he would have even been the guest referee for that match. So basically, WrestleMania 28, only 11 years earlier and without the cell. But he showed up to the TV tapings the week before WrestleMania in the obligatory no condition to perform, and he rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. And he had a falling out over all of this with Triple H, who he felt didn't stick up for him with Vince. And it was bad enough that the two didn't speak for an entire year. That's when he finally started to get his life together. And he tells the story in his book about being on the couch at home and he was just half, he was half gone. And his son at the time was about two. He had a two-year-old son who noticed and thought that you know daddy is sleeping and he he realized at that moment you know holy shit my kid is starting to notice i've hit rock bottom this is not good and he got on the phone he had a phone conversation i think that same night with kevin nash and on this phone call nash told him hey you need to call hunter and you need to apologize you guys need to patch this up and he did he, he called up triple h they made amends and the two of them were back to being good friends so now it's 2002. Sean comes back to TV as part of the NWO. A week later, he kicks, or literally kicks Booker T out of the group. I, I'll never forget that segment too, because you've got Shawn Michaels, Kevin Nash, I think Big Show, maybe X-Pac, and Booker T are all in the ring, right? And you look at this group, and, you know, all but Booker T have a little something in common here, and it's Booker T who they kick out of the group. And people did not, that did not go unnoticed. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of funny to look back on now, but uh, I always thought, oh, you know, he's looking at everybody in the group. Sean was in the ring evaluating everybody. And he's like, hmm, which one of these, which one of you guys doesn't belong? Oh, I know. I'll kick the black guy in the face and we'll kick him out of the group. 
It's like, wow, poor Booker T. So they kicked Booker out of the NWO. And they were teasing at the time that they were going to attempt to recruit Triple H into the group. And then after coming back, he had just come back from an injury. Kevin Nash is in that tag team match on Raw. This is in July of 2002. And his very first night back, he tears his quad. And he goes right back on the injury list. I think he had just come back from, oh my goodness, I think it was maybe like a a bicep tear. Some kind of arm injury, I want to say. But it's like he just came back. And he tears his quad, and he's been made fun of for it ever since. But that's, you know, that's a serious injury. That's not a fun injury to to endure. It's a lot of pain. You could tell he was in a lot of pain. And when he went down, so too did the NWO. Because the very next week, Vince McMahon comes out on television. They just lost one of their biggest members of the group. And he just officially disbands the NWO for good. So they go to Vengeance, the next pay-per-view. Triple H at the time is being recruited. He's a babyface. He's being recruited by the general managers of both shows. He's being recruited by Eric Bischoff to come to Raw. He's being recruited by his own wife, or in storyline, they may have been, uh, she may have been his ex-wife at that point. Uh, Stephanie McMahon trying to recruit him to come to SmackDown. Shawn Michaels shows up. He says, hey, if you come to Raw, we can reform DX. <laughs> they just killed the NWO. I got nothing, so let's do DX instead. Do me a solid. And Triple H agrees, and he follows Sean to the Raw brand, only for Triple H, I think this might have been the next night, to turn on Sean. He lays him out with a pedigree. Then came the violent uh, parking lot assault. A few weeks later, Sean Michaels is beaten up by a mystery person in the parking lot. It, it was like a little whodunit angle for all of a week or two. And then Michaels reveals the security camera footage that the building was kind enough to send to him. And it shows that Triple H was the culprit. It was Triple H all along who took out Shawn Michaels. And Triple H admits to it. He says, you know, you're weak, Shawn. You're weak. And Michael says, look, I may not be the showstopper anymore, but I can still fight. And thus, this street fight was made for SummerSlam. And it was thought to be a one-time thing. At least that's how Michaels kind of positioned it. He may have really thought that he was going to be, it was going to be a one and done. But again, his back was fine by that point. Maybe a little stiff, but... It, it wasn't back problems that kept him out for four and a half years. So I think, I think that he knew that if the match came off well, and it could not have come off any more perfectly than it did, that if this thing went off without a hitch, there was a pretty good chance that was not going to be the last time that we would see him inside the ring. Unlike the Crown Jewel match, where everything went wrong. Actually, Sean was kind of the glue that held that match together, Uh, My hope is that after that Crown Jewel match last year, if anything, it showed him that he should never, ever get back into the ring because I don't want to see Shawn Michaels in horrible, terrible matches like that again. So hopefully (laughs) it's the opposite now, and he realizes that his career is, is perfectly fine existing as it is, and we don't need to see him back in the ring again. So Shawn comes out. He's in street clothes for this. He's wearing jeans, uh, which made sense, given that it was a street fight, and they had said that the showstopper was dead coming into this match. This wasn't the HBK of old. This was Shawn Michaels, the man, fighting for his family. Triple H spends a good part of the match working over Shawn's back. It was an easy way uh, to work this match because every single move, every punch, every chair shot to the back, every backbreaker, the fans winced. People reacted to it. I probably winced also watching it live at that time. It was the story of the match. Again, chair shots to the back. He even gave Sean a backbreaker across a steel chair at one point. The storytelling in this match was fantastic. Between the back injury stuff, you know, it being Sean's first match back in so many years. His best friend betrayed him. He says he doesn't have it anymore. And the commentary just made this a hundred times better than it even, than it, It was already great, but it made it even that much better. And give credit not just to Jim Ross, who was was fabulous here, but give credit to Jerry Lawler, too. Jerry Lawler, kind of like he did in the Iron Man match between Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. You know, when I think back to Jerry Lawler's career as a commentator, you you think of the two phases, right? He used to be the heel announcer who would shit on the baby faces and Bret Hart and all those people. And then in kind of the second half of his career on commentary with WWE, I think really after he came back in, in 01... He was just legendary babyface Jerry Lawler. He wasn't really portraying the heel 
character anymore, which is kind of a shame. But a lot of the humor and the stuff that he did in the late 90s, it just was never going to fly. Especially in the late, like now. Can you imagine Lawler going on TV on one of those kickoff shows and saying half the shit that he said 20 years ago? There's no way. Uh, but when he had to, he stepped up his game. So I think back to the Iron Man match at WrestleMania 12. And he called that match with Jim Ross, you know, or actually it was Vince McMahon, very differently. You know, you, you would think a person like Jim Ross would be best suited to call a match like that. And not somebody like Jerry Lawler. And I remember thinking, hey, he did a pretty good job. He was more serious. Calling a, a more serious wrestling match. You know, kind of did that. There was an Iron Man match with Rock and Triple H. You know, at Judgment Day a few years later. So this was actually a good night, I thought, for, for Lawler and the announcing in general. He was uncharacteristically rooting for Shawn Michaels. He was rooting for the babyface throughout much of the match. But in doing so, what happened is, especially what, what happened after the match was over, they both did a great job of really making Triple H out to be just the devil incarnate. <laughs> like There's no more evil SOB on the face of the earth than this guy Triple H. So Michaels hit all of his signature spots. He even did the nip up late in the match to a huge reaction. He super kicked a chair back into Triple H's face and busted him open. He did this huge blade job, just wearing the crimson mask. Michaels also bled. He was DDT'd onto a chair, although not nearly as much as Triple H bled. Uh, but we got a double juice match here. Double juice. Abdullah approves. Hep C for everyone. So the fans had been chanting, we want tables earlier in the match. Later on, Michaels finally pulls one out from under the ring. He puts Triple H on top of it outside the ring, climbs up to the top rope, and does this huge diving splash out to the floor, crashes through the table. This is his first, like, big-time match in over four years. And he, maybe he really was thinking that this is it. This could be it for me. So I have to, I have to just go all out here. We got chairs we need tables and ladders and i gotta hit all my big spots because i don't know how my body is going to hold up so he did the big dive to the table he also brought a ladder into the ring he hit triple h a big one too and he hit triple h with a diving elbow off the ladder michael sets up for sweet chin music triple h catches his boot he boots him in the gut sets up for a pedigree michaels pulls his legs out from underneath and pulls off a sunset flip pin for the win Nearly half an hour after the opening bell. They gave it time. They built the story. It was just nearly flawless. And the Nassau Coliseum, upon when the ref hit three, when Earl Hebner hit three, just exploded. And Michaels gives Earl a big kiss on the head when it's all over. He's so happy that he survived. You can see him mouth the words, thank God, and praise the Lord. Right before Triple H whacks him in the back with a sledgehammer. <laughs> Triple H should have said, can I get a hallelujah? But he didn't do that. Michaels now is on his knees. Triple H hits him one more time in the back with the hammer for good measure. And Jim Ross absolutely loses it. He's like, no. For God's sakes, no. Just on and on. Oh, God. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, God almighty, no. It's like me. It's 7.59 every Monday night when I see the clock turn to 8 p.m. And he goes on, he says, I refuse to believe what I've seen. I refuse to believe that after the most courageous victory that maybe any of us have ever seen, that son of a bitch used that hammer. And the referees and the doctors roll in. Triple H gives Sean a crotch chop for good measure. And Jim Ross says that Triple H is going to rot in hell for what he did here. How in God's name can that human being be from this planet? Does he have no conscience? Does he have no heart? Do you have no soul, you son of a bitch? Do you realize what you've just done? And Michaels does a stretcher job on the way out. Not only did Sean come back for another match after this, he came back for another seven and a half years worth of matches. He won the world title from Triple H in the first ever Elimination Chamber match at Survivor Series that year, a reign that lasted all of one month, and that would be the last world title he would ever hold. But I, I've said this before, you know, his career is very much, I look at it like B.C. and A.D. It's like two totally distinctly separate eras. And back, it was back on, uh, I looked it up, it was episode 396 of The Sound Off. I answered a buy or sell question on Shawn Michaels' career. Pre-back injury or post-back injury? And it was a tough one because he had some great matches and great feuds and it really... 
is what made him as a singles performer right from the moment he threw Marty Jannetty through the barbershop window and took off as a singles heel. He had a great first half of his career in WWE. But I, I at the time, I bought on his post-back injury career. I thought that that just edged out the first part of his career. Because if you look at what this man did, his first match back with Triple H here, a classic. Wins the world title and the first chamber match a few months later. Racked up classic after classic at WrestleMania against Chris Jericho, against Triple H and Chris Benoit, against Kurt Angle, John Cena, The Undertaker two different times, including what I believe to be the greatest match in WrestleMania history, WrestleMania 25. The, the mini heel turn in the summer of 05 on Hulk Hogan in one of the great segments in Raw history in Montreal with the Bret Hart fake out. One of the all-time great promos. The feud with Chris Jericho in 2008, which they both had a hand in writing themselves, so no wonder it turned out so well. There's a lot of great stuff to point to in that second half of Sean's career, and he did all of that after... Uh, what at the time was a pretty crippling back injury. It wasn't life-threatening. It may not have even been career-threatening. It might have been built up as more than it was, but he came back from an injury. And yeah, he was older, and maybe as the years went on, he was a little slower. He couldn't do everything that he used to do, but he adapted. And he got to work with a whole new generation of talent, and he put on classics with them just the way he did with people like Kevin Nash and Vader and Mick Foley and Bret Hart. Razor Ramon, two totally different eras, two totally different generations, and he bridged the gap between those two. But if I had to vote one over the other, I'll probably stick to that same opinion I had on, on 396, and I would say I give the I give the edge to his post-back injury career. But it's amazing to see at that time when they were talking about it, like, well, it's just a one-time only thing, and then, you know, again, seven and a half years later, he finally decides to hang it up until... Crown Jewel last year, but we can try to forget that happened. 